Matt Cossens here, Chief Growth Officer at X Recruiter. Today I jumped on Confessions of a Recruiter with Blake and Declan. We talk about performance, we talk about good to great, we talk about making that leap. Let's go. All right, welcome back to another Confessions of a Recruiter episode. And this is a very, very special episode because we've got none other than the Chief Growth Officer of X Recruiter, Matthew Cossens. Thanks for joining us, Matthew. Thanks for having me, boys. So, mate, we're really excited that you're here because the big news came out, well, when everyone's listening a week ago now, mm-hmm. um, you have got an incredible background in recruitment. You've achieved a lot of things, and we were just talking about off-air um, just before this started, that you were the first podcast I actually ever listened to in recruitment five years ago. And now here we are today. We're working together, talking on a podcast. Yeah, pretty crazy, eh? Amazingly crazy. Yeah. Uh, So I think what would be really good for everybody is to get a bit of context on who you are when you first got into recruitment, some of your wins, Mm -hmm. maybe the industry that you you recruited in as well would be interesting and how you go about your daily life, what your mindset is. Because I think that's pretty important for a lot of people listening who want to be a high performer, they want to be excellent, they want to master their craft, they could probably get a lot out of that. So um, take us back, mate. How did you first yeah, get cool. into recruitment? Yeah, so I, I fell into recruitment like I think all, all good recruiters do, right? So I was a fishmonger and, and, and most people know this story, fishmonger to, to million dollar biller. What's a fishmonger? So I was like working in a fish shop, um, doing both retail sales and down at the docks. Um, so pretty rough. It's a, a great way to learn about life, great way to get street smart. Um, How'd you so- get into that? So I literally walked past and they said, you know, staff wanted. And I was like, great, I'm working at university. I need a job. Uh, you know, let's see if I can jump in there. Uh, and, and that turned into a two or three year kind of filler as I, as I um, went through university. So pretty of a trippy role. I never thought I'd be a fishmonger, but... Uh, yeah. She's like, mate, we've got tuna for 70 bucks a kilo. Mate, Come you get were it. yelling out. Yeah, like <laughs> all, of, all of that part. Really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wow. It was like, yeah, proper, proper old school, you know, like yell at the market. Um, yeah, it was quite fun. Um, so I kind of started there. I did a degree in HR, knew I wasn't going to be a HR professional. And in fact, the dean said, you'll, you'll be a HR nightmare. Uh, maybe I'm not PC enough, um, but she's like, recruitment's hard. It sucks. But if you're good at it, you can make lots of money. As a, you know, what was I, 21, 22 year old, I was like, okay, that sounds great. I'll give it a go. Interviewed at three places, got offered at two. Uh, Interpro turned me down. Shout out to Interpro. Uh, <laughs> I turned out all right. Uh, but I got offered at, uh, at Drake and Greythorn, and I, I chose Greythorn and, and started in IT recruitment. So they, they did a six to eight week kind of boot camp. Then it was, you know, jump on, jump on the floor, 40 salespeople, very kind of Wolf of Wall Street back in those days. We're talking 05, um, massive sales team, global business, and it was single swim, and I absolutely loved it. What did you love about it? Just the energy, like there's, oh, there's something mate. about a sales floor, right? Like and a big sales floor and, and, and we probably don't have as many of them these days unless you're in a big national, but you know, 40 people, small space, absolute buzz, everyone there was flying. So their growth trajectory was, was kind of off the charts. So from 05 to 2010, you know, they kind of scaled to exit and they, they sold to 510 group. Um, but just the energy and the people in the room, like there was just so many killers um, and so many people to learn from. So I was just like a sponge. I was like, yep, sit, sit me by the best people. But they had so many good people to learn from. So you were just every day just hearing excellence on the floor. And, you know, what a, what a great way to, to kind of learn your craft and, and, and be planted in that kind of an environment. 100%. So, so gra- this was Greythorn? Yeah, yeah. And so there was all these really high performers, big yeah. sales floor. Do you feel like if you didn't, get into recruitment in that environment from day one, the outcome of who you are today would be much different? Ooh, good question. I'm going to say no. I think if you're a driven individual, you find a way, right? Yeah. Um, but certainly if you land in the right place and you're planted in the right soil, you're just going to grow quicker. You know, so could have I landed somewhere else and it would have been a slower journey? Sure. Um, but I think it's on you as an individual to, to, to be great wherever you are and, and kind of find that path and find that way. But if you're in the right environment, you just fast track and, and accelerate that. So that first five years of my career, I feel like I did kind of 10x um, just because I was around the right people and I was learning around the right people. Uh, and I think most people, they don't think about that when they when they start out, right? They're just, okay, I just want to work. It's like, but choosing that right leader, choosing that right culture, that right sales floor, like that can be the difference between being average or being amazing. 
Yeah, you know what? I, it's it's funny you say that because I've always been under the mindset of I really don't care what I do for a living. I just want to work with great people that provide value to my life. Yep. Like if I was picking up rubbish on the side of the street, but I was with a bunch of guys that I was learning heaps from and I was growing as an individual, I'd be picking up rubbish on the street. I'm not too picky when it comes to the tasks and duties of what we do, but as long yep. as we're doing it with really good people, then that's that's the buzz. So it sounds like a similar philosophy that you've just explained around make sure you get amongst good leaders and good people that are doing stuff and you'll be able to grow quicker. Yeah, and I think as a young person, you probably take that a bit for granted. Like I probably didn't know at the time because you didn't know I didn't know anything different, right? It's like I got into grace and I was like, yep, this is great. I think as you mature and you get older, it's like actually that makes a huge difference and getting that right is so, so, so important. You know, a lot, of, a lot of recruiters that we speak to that are really high performers, all of them go into like super cutthroat environments mm -hmm. that are like ultra micromanaging, ultra high volume, ultra pressure. And at the time they all go, oh, that was tough, that job. And they're all like, no one would survive these days in that environment. But because they, then they use their hindsight and they go, that was the best job I've ever had because that really crafted who I am today, gave me a really good foundation. So um, it's it's interesting around the the leadership piece and getting into a into a space where you have that opportunity and at the time you might not you might not realise that you're in a good spot to to learn a lot because you're probably under the pressure and um, you know you're not you're not seeing the the, the green I guess um, but um, it's yeah it's interesting that you say that because that's a lot of the things that we're talking about all the time yeah you yeah. need that as a young person I think that's yeah. all you should be looking for from 20 to 30 yeah. like don't even worry about the money side of things if you can get around the best people then the money's going to come yeah because you build those habits and routines right and you, relationships that, yeah and they just happen because you're in the right space um, and when I meet people who who are average performers it's usually they're the big fish in the small pond right like mm. they're the best biller at their agency but the best biller is 300k right whereas if you're surrounded by million dollar billers it's like well 300k you know, that people are laughing at you right like they, they don't take you seriously um, so it's, it's kind of I, I think that's the challenge some people have they just land in this wrong spot and they get this false identity around it's kind of like when you're at school and you're, you know, you run, you're, you're the fastest person in your school, right? You're running cross country. You then go to the state championships. And you go, go to do, where the fuck and, did and, all and, and you people get, come yeah. from? And you get blasted. Right? <laughs> you're not yeah. even in the game. You realise you're not even in the game, right? Yeah. And I think there's a real interesting thing with a, a, a lot of performers and I think there's a, a, a lot of parallels between sport and business and it's no different. There's a lot of people who go into that environment um, and then retreat. It's like, no, I'm happy just being the, the, the fastest person in my school. But that elite performer or that person with that killer mindset, they get into that environment. It's like, that's what spurs them on. It's like, okay, now I want another coach. Now I need ABC. Now I'm going to train every morning at 5 a.m. because I'm fired up. I think that's no different in recruitment. Um, I think those parallels are, are, are really important. So, mm -hmm. so finding that A-grade team, like you're, you're going to be miles ahead of, of, of those other performers just because you're in the right spot. Yeah, and it's even like... I was chatting to Jack from Yakka and he said, because he, he played under 20s and won NRL game. Mm -hmm. And he was like, mate, the biggest thing is is feedback. Like you just got to cop feedback, make yeah. a decision. And that's why athletes do so well in sales because yep. no one can handle feedback these days. Yeah, they just get, so true. you know, it ends up, you know, not going well if you yep. just give, but take, cr cr like if you're playing footy and it's like, mate, hands up, get your fucking hands up. You got to catch the ball. You're like, yep, yeah. no worries. Hands are up. And <laughs> yeah. then you just put your hands up and catch the ball. And then like you can progress to the next stage. Yeah. But I think everyone's getting um, soft. a bit soft. Yeah. Oh, 100%. In that sense. You can't do jack shit these days. <laughs> yeah. Even discussing this on the podcast might get um, a few turned heads, yeah. but upset a few snowflakes. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's but it. I think that coaching and feedback, like it's critical. And, and it's, it's so important. And there's cultures that just don't have that. I've worked in environments where it's like, if you coach someone on the floor, they kind of look like you like, what, what, what are you doing? Like, I'm not bad at my job. No, I'm just trying to make you better. Whereas I think someone who comes from, whether it's a team sport or an individual sport, and I've done both, but if you've played at a semi-elite level, you're, you're used to coaching, right? That's just what happens. And, um, and I think the people who are like that, they're the people who exceed because they don't take it personal. It's like, that was a great phone call, but you could have done this better. Yeah. Um, and I was really blessed kind of early in my career um, you know, and all the way through really to have people who, who would take that investment. So like Matt, fantastic phone call, you know, but if you answer, if you ask the question this way, you'll get a better result. Um, or if you ask this, you might get a different outcome. 
Um, and, and it's all those little pieces of advice that, that made a, a huge difference in that kind of good to great transition. Yeah, so what, what was that like in your first year? Because when I was listening to your podcast five, six years ago, um, you were talking about that you – what did you bill in your first year of recruitment? Yeah, so I'd, I had 54 placements in my first first year. And billings were kind of mid threes, right, because it scales up. So I was a contract contract biller. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of laying that foundation for, for year two. Year two, I kind of scaled close to 750. And that transition between year two and year three was, was the first kind of step to a million dollar biller. And then from there, I've, I've kind of been a million you know, forever or a million plus forever. So my biggest number was 2.3 or 2.35. Um, but I've always kind of sat over that million dollar mark for, for the rest of the career. Wow. So you were billing a million bucks how long ago? 15 years ago. Was that? Yeah, 2008. Yeah, yeah, 2008. You're making me do the math on the spot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 15 years ago. So was that like, were you a unicorn? Was, was everyone like, holy shit, Matt, third it was a, it year? Was a big into- number. Yeah, it was a big number for, for that that level of experience for three years in. But, you know, Grayson had had million dollar billers. Like that wasn't foreign territory for them. They had a handful. Um, so in, in Melbourne, they had million dollar billers, Sydney and Canberra. Um, and they had million pound billers in the UK. So for them, that wasn't like, oh my gosh, this guy is unbelievable. It was like, yeah, he's really good. You know, and I, I would have been in the top 5% of the company. But it wasn't like, wow, this is, this is you know, territory we haven't seen before. So, so what do you put your results down to mainly? It was a, Did you have a really good leader that like coached you on calls that you could have done better, as you said, you know, good to great? Or was it something internally, law yeah. of averages? Yeah. yeah, kind of a handful of things there. So, so yes, good leader, um, very good mentors outside of the business. So I, I sought out mentors outside of the business. And, you know, I, I've, I've spoken openly. David Carmen was a, a, a very good mentor of mine early days, um, particularly in that grey thorn journey. Um, but I'd, I sought out mentors outside of recruitment as well. Had a couple of clients who are mentors. Even today, I have four or five really good mentors that I talk to for uh, any decisions I make. So I think that was that was key. But the big one was just hustle and mindset, right? So I turned up every day thinking I was the best in Melbourne, right? And and people laugh at that and they go, "Did you actually say that in the mirror?" Yes, I did. Right, because um, I'm huge on affirmations. I'm huge on how you turn up. I'm huge on kind of triggers and walking through doors and having a little phrase that kind of locks you in for the day. Um, so mindset was a big one, and then just grind. Yeah, and 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 they were the, the days where the grind was expected. Right, again, coming back to kind of people being soft. It's like people do a nine hour day and think that's hard now. Right, mm. like if you did that at Greythorn or, or in any of the environments I was in. I'd be like, why are you working half? Like people would joke like, oh, half day today, Maddie. Right? So it's like you were expected to do at least 10 hours a day. So I was in at seven. I was out at six most nights. Um, so let me ask you this. So when you're working and putting in all these hours that, that frankly, I don't think a lot of new recruiters do. Yeah. They, they're certainly within the, you know, eight to five, let's mm-hmm. go home. Mm-hmm. So did someone tell you you need to put in extra hours when you first started and that's when you thought, okay, I'm going to break the shackles off and just do whatever it takes? Or was this something that you chose to do on your own accord? So there's two things there. So, so one, there was an expectation. So I, I turned up and they're like, well, your contracted hours are 8.30 to 5.30, but everyone does 8 to 6, right, as a minimum. That's what we expect. I was like, okay, cool. So I was just like, well, I'm just going to get in at 7 then and I'm going to be at least till 6. Um, if I'm first in, last out. Yeah, that sets the tone. And then as soon as the results were coming, it's like, well, that's a part of the result. Um, and you've got to, but you've got to know what you're sacrificing for, right? So I didn't come from money. Um, I've, I've spoken openly about that in the past. And if you've got a big driver and, 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 and a big why, and, and, and a lot of that for me was family and freedom, um, and some of that freedom comes from wealth. <laughs> It was like, okay, well, that's the driver, right? So if that's the driver, what have I, what have I got to do? I have to sacrifice. Uh, and a lot of people these days won't sacrifice family time or you know, those things for what they want. But you, if you know what success is for you, you know, then you've just got to draw that path, right? So I was very open with my wife. So I'm very, you know, communicate early, communicate often. We do our goals together. Here's our goal. Here's what we want to achieve. To do that, this is what it means. Right? I'm in a sales business. You know, this is the money we could achieve, but that means you know, this level of commitment, this level of hours. Uh, and it comes back to that kind of time, talent, intensity that I, I talk about often. It's like you've got to put in the time. You've got to be growing your talent and you've got to be intense when you're in. So, you know, the, you know any role I've been in, that level of intensity through the day is just through the roof, right? Because there's, there's no point in doing 12 hours at 50%. You want to do you know, 
10 to 12 hours at 100, 100 plus. Yeah. So I feel like that was similar to us when we started in recruitment. We'd get excited about coming in on a Saturday to build a hit list. Yeah. So we'd be ready yeah. to go for Monday, hit list yeah. at night, falling asleep on the laptop. Mm-hmm. Deanna's like, mate, where do you work? This is not normal. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I'm yeah. falling asleep in bed next to her trying to, like, I have to get this hitty ready for tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. And always just listening, right? Like, I'm like, dad BD, you know, I'm down at the, down at the playground with the daughter. And it's like, you hear someone talk about IT because I was a tech recruiter. And it's like, I'm going to go and talk to that guy. Yeah. <laughs> right? Did you have, just always on. Did you have any pushback? with your partner because i'm just thinking about a lot of conversations that i've i've had with other um high performers Mm -hmm. that sacrifice a lot that are really devoted to success in their career and sometimes there's a lot of friction between them and their partner on hey you need to be home more why aren't you home more all this kind of stuff so was there any difficult or like challenges personally when you've decided that no i'm i'm going to be an elite performer i know what i'm sacrificing what was the conversation like at home? Yeah, so um, so shout out to the wife. She's amazing. Um, she's been brilliant, right? And I think a big part of that is is that communication piece, right? So doing goals together, having that open conversation, she knew what it meant, right? So it was like, this is the path I'm, I'm traveling down. This is what it means for our family. This is what we're going to achieve. Now, if we weren't achieving it, I think we would have had difficult conversations. Mm. But if you set that tone, you set that, you know, here's the plan. I need five years. I need, you know, whatever, whatever that time frame is, then you just got to go and bloody deliver, right? And because I was delivering, because she could see the fruits of that labor um, and life was becoming easier for us, it was like, well, keep doing what you do. Yeah. Um, but it's about that open communication and that changes every year. And that's changed. Yeah, and, and the goal setting process we go through really kind of locks us in because it's very clear that, okay, you want to achieve this, I want to achieve this. As a family, we want to achieve these things together. But then what does that mean? What are we willing to sacrifice? And what is that sacrifice? Because that's the part people miss, right? You can have these big goals, but you haven't had an open conversation around sacrifice and what it actually means. That's where you have conflict. Um, so we've never had conflict over me working too hard, right? And she knows my personality type. It's like, if I'm interested in anything, it's like, I'm all in. Right? Ice bar is a good example. You boys have done that with me before. It's like, that started with a, hey, I've got into some breath work. I've done my first ice bath. Uh, I now do it every day. She does it every day. You know, we're, we're way You're down. certified Wim Hof. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're <laughs> going crazy, right? Yeah. We're going absolutely crazy. But she knows that's my personality type as well. Right? It's if, if, if I'm into something, I'm all in. If I'm not interested, cool, I'll do it once and I'm done. Um, but I think that communication part is, is, is the part people miss. And then also understanding, say, their love language, what makes them tick, and, and what are those things you're going to do for the family so that you're on with your family. Right? So when I go on holidays, I'm not sitting on the phone. I right? don't take the phone, don't take the laptop. Um, it's like if I'm locked in with the kids, I'm locked in with the kids. You catch me on Saturday at, at breakfast, I'm at breakfast. You know, there's no phone ringing, I leave it in the car. Yeah, because um, that undivided intention is, is is just as important for them. So if I'm going to lock in at work, I've got to also be able to flick that switch and lock in at home. And pe- and, and people miss that, right? They get home, they're tired. Um, and if we come back to the same mindset, the the door frame trigger I have when I, I walk through my door at home is they deserve my best, right? So I sit in the car and I know like that's what I'm going to say in my head as I walk through the front door. So it's like I have to be ready to to live that, right? But if you can do that, then then I think that really helps. And what are the building blocks to get there? So like, you know, you come home after a 10 or 12 hour day, your missus like, where you been? Why are you working late? And then, <laughs> oh, well, yeah, yeah. Where you been? Yeah. Work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, we all know the conversation. <laughs> and then, so how do you build up to that? Because it's all well and good, like, is it to be like, all right, I'm going to be my best self, walk in and, and be your best self. There's obviously, that's a, that's a skill yeah. that's got to be learned. Yeah. So like, how, can you summarize how you learn that skill or how can the, and the novice person that's feeling yeah. the heat from these missus yeah. to be coming home and being like, I've got my best self as I walk through the door. Yeah. Do, do you start like two kilometers away from your house envisioning what that's going to look like? Yeah, good question. So you've got to have a bit of a, a ritual and a routine, right? So everything I do is around ritual, routine, habits. So whether that's the morning habit, the evening habit, it's no different from when I, I go home. So I drive home in the car. So I usually have a podcast on or some kind of personal development usually for half the journey home like I, I like to I have 45 minutes to an hour depending on traffic so I like half of that to be you know learning something um I don't know it's just a space that I, I, that I enjoy unless I'm making work phone calls which which you know in, in which case I'll, I'll, I'll do that instead um but once I get off the freeway in, in Ringwood which is about 10 minutes from my house it's like okay now I just need to put on some tunes get myself in the headspace get my energy back uh, and be ready to walk through that door um, so for me, it's just about building in that habit and then it being big enough for you, right? It's not like, 
you, you can't just go, okay, cool, I've got a trigger, I'm going to walk through and everything's going to be amazing. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But it's like you've got to, you've got to really spend that time in some gratitude. Like what is it? So I, I really use gratitude as a, well, you know, how do I feel about my family? How do I feel about my kids? How do I feel about what, what am I? What am I grateful for? So by the time I get to that door, it's like I've already got myself into that space, right? Because everything I do is for them, right? So if I looked at my why, a huge part of my why is around family and setting them up generationally. And I think if you've got that, it's really easy to to, to kind of fall into that space, right? Because I don't I don't do work for me, right? Like work for me isn't about my ego, hey, I bill X, I do Y. Well, um, it's not about that. For me, it's about, you know, and, I, and I'll, I'll use another sporting analogy. I think about the name on the back of the jersey, right? Not Matt, Matt as a person. It's the name on the back of the jersey. So what am I doing for my family? What am I doing for us generationally? That's what I, you know, that's kind of what drives me. And that's not about, that's not about wealth. That's about, you know, how do they think differently? Because I was here. You know, like, I want my kids to think differently to how I thought. You know, my dad set a, a, a great foundation for hard work. But I know my girls think differently because of you know, what I do. You know, just pivoting to your uh, performance and your habits and your rituals and all the crazy stuff that you do, I usually refer to you as the Australian version of Goggins. Yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, Stay yeah. hard. Yeah, yeah, because, <laughs> because you certainly do have um, a really strong ethos of – Work hard, get outside your comfort zone, don't be a little bitch, yeah. just remove all obstacles, like yeah. remove all the, the reasons why you can't do something and just do it, which is, it's really, um, it's really magnetic. Like when, you, when you're around someone that really lives and breathes that, it makes you feel like you can also do that too. Yeah. So it's, it's really fun being around you and talking to you around what your habits are and what your philosophy is and mindset because- it kind of overflows and I'm sure with the people that you've coached in the past, mm-hmm. either internally at your previous um, employment mm-hmm. or externally, you know, external recruiters that yeah. seek out your, your advice and your mentorship, uh, it really goes a really, really long way. Yeah. So um, I, I just, I thought I'd bring that up because I think that's a, a funny analogy to, to use because really, you know, cage fighting, mm-hmm. Was it an ultra marathon? Yeah, an ultra, yeah, eighty k's, yeah. Ultra marathon, cage fighting. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we can try and get you to do like the world's most amount of pull ups <laughs> or something like that. Over the next Think four thousand pull ups, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give it a go. Yeah, maybe that I know could the be. Australian burpee champion. He did eleven thousand. So did he? Yeah. Oh, you'd smash that, man. I definitely wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to RJ. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's it's really infectious, uh, yeah. basically, to 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 feel that energy. Yeah. So you're at Greythorn. You did really well in your earlier years. Um, you built up to a million bucks. Was it a cold desk, yeah, essentially? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it was split. So, you know, they had five people doing infrastructure. So I started in, in contract infrastructure, uh, help desk, desktop support, infrastructure engineers, uh, then moved into project services after I won a, a few big clients and then you know, kind of just blew up from there. Um, but they had five people in that space when I started because you had 40, 40 salespeople, right? So, and they actually gave me, I thought, the worst desk at the time and it turned out, it turned out to be the best desk. Yeah, right. Because awesome. of what you made it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so it was like underdeveloped, nothing happening. Uh, it was like logistics, utilities. So they did it by like um, industry sector. Yeah. Uh, and that sector for them was undercooked. Um, three years later, it was the best sectors they had. Yeah, and mate, a big thing is like leveling up. Like watching or reading your blog post yesterday, that's sort of been your mission the whole way through yeah. your whole career. Yeah, um, and it, it's a massive theme at Hex Recruiter. Like I think that's one of the exciting things mm-hmm. that brought us together. Yeah, um, staff get bonuses to level up and self learn and develop, and same with yourself. What um, What did you do early on that was so critical? Because I think that story of you paying the consultant or that recruitment trainer. Yep. All of your salary yep. is, you know, putting your money where your mouth is very early on. Yeah, You're 23 at the time, like 22. How, do you, how did you know these moves to make? Or was yeah. it just, did it feel natural? And tell us about the story as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I didn't actually end up paying it, which is good. It, you know, I was blessed that he, he didn't uh, didn't take it. But um, yeah, I think a, a few people know the story. I reached out to a mentor who was coaching a, a, a lot of the CEOs uh, in nationally and, and, and rang him after a training course. And he's like, Matty, with all due respect, I, I, I coach you know, this person, this person, this person, you know, the, the who's who of recruitment. Um, you know, and, and financially it's not going to work for you. And I was like, I'll just give you the whole, the, the whole salary, right? Like I get paid commission. I'm, I'm confident I'm going to make it happen. 
he's just like, you're crazy. Like, you are a madman. I'll just coach you. Like, I'll just look after you. And that turned into like a, f- a five-year relationship. And, and to this day, I, I can ring him and, uh, and, and seek advice. But I think it's about wanting to get in front of better people, right? And wanting to get into different rooms. So even now, if I see someone who's got an attribute that I aspire to have, whether that's in business, whether that's in family, whether that's in fitness, I, 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 I am not you know, the, the best version of me yet. I, you, know, you can't win that game. But it's like if I find that person, I, I want to reach out to them and learn, right? So I still have that now. So if I look at my mentors, I'm blessed with you know, four or five amazing mentors. Mm. But I've got no problem with coming up to you on the street if, if I think you've got something or I, I see you communicate a certain way and being like, hey, can I sit down and, and buy you lunch? Right? Like I, I shared a story and, and you know, one of the guys I used to work with you know, and, and this didn't happen because the car didn't come back but there was a Lambo Urus in, in, in where I park, park my car normally. And I was like, mate, I'm just going to leave a note on their windscreen. He's like, why? And I was like, well, because they've clearly achieved a level of you know, success that I haven't got. I haven't got a Urus in the, in, in the driveway yet. <laughs> we'll say yet. Um, but I'm like, you know, maybe I can learn something from this person. And he's like, dude, you're crazy. I was like, what's the worst that can happen? Right? They don't ring me back. Right? They throw the note in the bin. Um, but I was like, if I see the person getting into the car, I'm going to be like, hey, can I take you for lunch? Right? Because can I learn something from them? Maybe. You know, and, and I have no fear of rejection. We're in recruitment, right? We get rejected all the time. But why wouldn't you pursue excellence? But the, the, the path has already been, been stepped out, right? Like I look at a Goggins and, and you know, don't get me wrong, I'll take Australian Goggins all day, every day. <laughs> but, uh, but like if I met someone like him, I'd want to go to lunch. I'd, I'd be the guy who'd be like, okay, I know he's going for a 30K run. I'm going to go for, yeah, I'm just going to turn up at the run, right? Because I want to steal that knowledge, right? That mindset is next. Like I'm not at that level of mindset. Um, but you've got to go and sight, and you've got to go and find those people, and not be afraid to just pick up the phone. And I think what most people will find if they're listening, if you make that call and you have that vulnerability, I've not had someone turn me down to be no. a mentor, either paid or unpaid. They're either pumped to come on, yeah, like the, whether yeah. it be a podcast or a coffee or a yeah, or and, lunch. All, and awesome performers want to see other people succeed, mm. right? Like so, anyone who reaches out to me, and and I coach a couple of people. You know, around the world you know, um, who've, who've just reached out to me where it's like, I'll help you because you've, you've made the effort, right? And so many people invested into me, so why wouldn't I invest into, into that next generation? And again, that comes back to that, that why, that legacy. So outside of the family, the other big part for me is, is I want to see other people succeed. I want to see them level up. Like that's the thing that fires me up more than anything is oh, mate, you know, seeing greatest. you boys kill it, see the team kill it, see them achieve their dreams. Like – because then they pass it on to the next, right? So, so it's it's that multiplication effect of of getting other people to 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 you know, that level of performance. It's that place of abundance, which is yeah, just the best. See yeah. them grow. Yeah. And w- what about there's? I feel like there's a lot of rusty nail syndrome where people, you know, have you heard about the dog sitting on a rusty nail? No, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Where's he going with the yeah, rusty mate. nail? Yeah, mate. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> yeah, the dog and the rusty nail. So, uh, homeowner gets home, he and he's chatting to his dog, and his dog's like, "Oh, I'm so sore." And he's like, "Why? What's wrong, mate?" And he goes, "Oh, I found the problem, mate. Looks like you're sitting on a rusty nail. You've got a rusty nail in your backside." And he's like, "Yeah, I know." He's like, well, why don't you just take it out? And he goes, oh, because then I'll have nothing to complain about. I'd rather just, it doesn't hurt enough to make change, yeah. um, but doesn't hurt too much to take it out. So I'm just going to leave it in here and complain. Yeah. So like, how do you break people down to get them to the point where they can actually reach out and not be feared? Like it's, it's like so many people sit there failing and just like complaining and going, it's not going to get better. It's not going to get better. Like how do you, if you can get them past that period to the point where they want to put a letter on a Lambo and say, hey, meet me. I'll buy you lunch. Yeah. Like how do you, how do you break people or how can people get out of that rusty nail syndrome and actually make that first move? Yeah, no. Is it just, cause in like, I'm on, I'm on the same thing. Yeah. Like, you know, prime example, I was like, Oh, how good would Matt be to be a part of the team? And that was a, you know, a passing comment four months ago. And here we are. Here we and there's are, all these yeah. little intricacies that's brought us all together over the years. Yeah. Um, and like Blake's done it with multiple people. I do the same thing. Like, politicians and um, big business people around here have all come on a previous podcast and they're all happy to do it. Yeah. But like people struggle to just reach out Yeah. and it blows my mind because the, the value that we've all experienced is just absurd. Like everyone's happy to do it, but I don't know. How do you get people just to break out? Is it fear? Is it them being proud? Is it ego? Like to me, I can't understand why you wouldn't. Yeah. Well, why you wouldn't want why to get you better. Wouldn't. Just <laughs> fucking yeah, yeah, the yeah, biggest yeah, yeah. hack is just asking someone who's done it yeah. and repeat it. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know what the, I think the root cause is different for everyone, right? Yep. But I mean, it's, it's the million dollar question. I wish I could get everyone to that point, but I can't make you want what you don't want, right? And I think that's the problem is, is some people, they like that place of complaining. They like that place of comfort. 
right? Discomfort sucks. You know, I, I shared with you boys uh, earlier in the week the winning, you know, the, the book winning, winning by Tim Grover. And it's like, how do you define winning? Winning's hard. It sucks. It's toil. It's heartache. It's late nights. It's early mornings. It's grind. It's horrible. But you're going to have some championship moments along the way, right, that make it amazing. But most people don't want that grind, mm. right? Um, they don't want that hard work. They don't want that sacrifice. It's like everyone says to me, oh, your life is so easy. Cool. You want to come and follow me again in 2005, right? And, and, and do you want to go on this 15-year journey? It's like, yeah, it looks easy and great now. But that's for ridiculous amounts of hustle, right? But most people don't want to do that. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and that's just the way it is. Comfortable is, is nice for some people. Yeah, because you get to the point now where you're like, fuck, this is so fucking hard. And then you're like, this is the next phase of growth. Yeah. At any time something gets really fucking hard and you're like, what the fuck? The next time is just like obscene Winning, winning gets harder every time, right? Yeah. Winning, the, the better you get, I think the, the harder winning becomes. Um, and I love that, but most people don't love that, mm. right? They, they, they don't want to go like, okay, I've got to push my body to another place. Um, you see that all the time. And I think that's the biggest risk in, in our industry, particularly but in, in any industry that's performance-led, is you can get to a level of comfort easily, right? So you start in discomfort. Okay, maybe I'm starting out in recruitment. It sucks, it's hard, I want to make some money. You then get to your 100 grand or your 150 grand, and it's like, maybe I don't want anything anymore, right? And I see so many people who plateau when they get to that level of comfort. It's like, but you could do two, three, four, five. You know, there's people I coach who do seven figures, right, in recruitment, not not in their own agency, working for someone else, right? And so that's not billions, that's what they get paid. That's what they get paid, right? Yeah. So they're doing two, two and a half, um, you know, I had a, there was a guy at Auric who was doing 3.2, 3.1, 3.2, right? Big numbers, huge commission checks, most driven people I've ever met. Um, but so many people will get to that 150 and be like, I'm good, tap out, right? I'm done. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I wish I knew that, you know, that secret sauce, but you know, I think the- It's as, not as having a, a goal past the goal. Yeah, correct. You just got to keep pushing, right? And you've got to have those people around you who show that excellence is way, way ahead of you. And it's about having the, again, it comes back to environment or seeking out an environment where you've got those people who are pushing you or you've got that leader who says you could do more. Okay, so if there are any recruiters out there that are interested to find out what it's like to have a VA support them in their role, whether that be to bill more, uh, reduce tasks that they don't enjoy doing or be a more effective recruiter in their niche, then we definitely recommend reaching out to the outsource people or top. Reach out to them, inquire on how they can implement a VA in your agency and to support you. And if you mention X recruiter or confessions of a recruiter, they will give you a 13% discount off your bill per month on this VA that will allow you to scale your business, scale your desk, and to bill more and make more money. So go reach out to the outsource people, say Confession sent you, get your discount and see what is possible. I think a lot of people have a disjoint between their internal ambitions and their external actions. Mm -hmm. I know for me, when I first started in recruitment, well, before I started in recruitment, generally when I was growing up, I felt like I had a lot of, skill, talent, ambition, mm. I'm going to be something great, blah, mm. blah, blah. But my external actions never aligned with what I thought, uh, how good I was. Yep. And it wasn't until I finally, I don't know, broke the shackles or got out of my own way of uh, short-term gratification where once my external actions aligned with my internal values and and um, thought processes that I actually started elevating a lot further. And I see that with a lot of people, you know, you'll sit down with them and you'll go, what do you want to achieve? And they're like, I want to achieve this. I want that. I want this. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, what are you doing today to get there? And they're like, oh, nothing. Yeah. I'm just doing this. Yeah. And it's like, oh, well, why don't you do ABC and you'll actually get there. It's really, really easy. It's only like changing 10% of your daily routine and you'll probably double your outcomes. Yeah. But for some reason they just can't get past this, this first base hurdle of of trying to overcome these short term gratifications, whether it be oh, I'm just gonna watch Netflix, I'm just gonna order Uber Eats, mm -hmm. oh, I can't be bothered doing BD calls today. Just the really little things that end up compounding quite a lot. Yeah. Um, so yeah, decisions on feelings. Yeah. Yeah, decisions on feelings, and I think yep. Matt Matt brings up a, a really uh, interesting point. I think that I heard you in our ninety day induction programs at X Recruiter. 
is I'm not here to motivate you. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't believe in motivation. I believe in discipline and good habits. Yeah. And motivation is bullshit. Yeah, like, like in, yeah. in the nicest way possible, right? Like if I have to motivate you, I'm going to get tired. You're going to get tired. And it's not going to happen, right? Like <laughs> motivation will help you maybe one, one day in a hundred, right? Where it's like, I'm struggling. Okay, cool. I, 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 I listen to something. I get G'd up. I, I, I make it happen. It's discipline and habits all day. Right, it's doing things you don't want to do, doing them with excellence when you don't feel like it. Yeah, that's what you need. Um, so many people are like, oh, I need to be. If someone says to me in an interview, I need to be motivated, it's like, cool, wrong, tick, yeah, you're gone, yeah, next. Because um, you just can't do it. I can't make you want what you don't want. Yeah. Right? Like if I need to motivate you to get there, you're the wrong person. Yeah. Um, I want that person who's coachable, a sponge, who's just like, Matt, I'm just going to grind, right? Point me in the right direction. Give me, give me the the framework. Give me the tools. Success leaves clues, you know, and I'll follow that to a T. And I think that's what people miss is they all live life by accident. So I talk, I talk all the time around life by design instead of life by accident. All right. So what do you want to achieve? Cool. Now let's break that down into a plan. Yeah. You know, and if that plan's not working, let's tweak the plan. Let's move the plan. But most people fail through lack of activity, right? Lack of momentum. Lack of discipline. Um, you know, on basic, simple things. That's right. You, you sh- a- any role, whether it's recruitment, whether it's you know, any role you do, you should know the top five things that, that, that move the needle, right, that make you successful. Just do them every day, every single day. What are the top five for the people that don't know? Yeah, so if, if I'm looking at recruitment, there's probably not, I don't even think there's five in recruitment, right? Number one is prospecting every day, right? You have to be doing it every day. You mean- what if you have 200 jobs on yeah, what if you're really busy? Yeah, yeah. yeah what? If, yeah, what if? What, what if, if you do, what if your dog ran out of the house <laughs> that, that morning <laughs> and sitting on a rusty nail? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so twenty jobs still prospect, still prospect. Find a way to make it happen. And if they're contingent, prospect them into retained or exclusive. Yeah, retained or exclusive. You're bang on. Uh, and I think so many people use that as an excuse. I've got five jobs on now. Cool. Like, what's the likelihood of filling those five jobs? Right. Normally, when you get under the covers, those five jobs, half of them probably aren't qualified. And you know, there's maybe, you know, if you're lucky, one or two are exclusive or retained. You know, if you're great, different story. But the great recruiters I know are prospecting every day. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a person I, I coach at the moment. In his first month back in January, 90 client meetings. Right? So Wait, what? 90 client meetings. In a booked. month? In a month, he booked. Right, 90, nine, zero. Throughout the year? No, for, for the next... Kind of six, what, four to six weeks. That's three a day, every day. Yeah. Yeah, that's what excellence looks like. How, how did he do that? Prospecting. Right? Yeah, right. And, and, and so when I meet people and they're like, I don't have time to prospect. It's like, cool, this person does over two million. Uh, and I won't say their name for, for confidentiality, but they do over two million. They've booked 90 client visits. All right, you can imagine the outcomes that have come out of that in terms of you know, number of jobs, number of connections. Uh, and, and we rolled into the next month and the number was very similar. And I'm like, damn, like that's, that's excellence, right? Uh, he knows who, who, who he knows, knows. He's listening yeah, right he's now. Listening, so we he's know who he's loving. He's, he's, he's smiling. He's, he's, he's probably it. like, Matty, just he's tell everyone it. who yeah, I am. Yeah, just, just drop the name. Just, yeah, drop the name, yeah. big fella. Yeah. Um, but then I meet recruiters and they're like, they can't make 90 BD calls a month. Yeah. No. <laughs> and I'm, I'm telling you now, I, I don't think every call was a, yeah, cool, come and meet me, right? So um, so that's, you know, that's what excellence looks like. Um, but you've got to have those things, right? Um, and, and most people don't have that level of grind. Um, None. Okay, so one's prospecting every day. Yeah, so prospecting every day, huge one, right? Yeah. You need to be talking to candidates every you know, Simple. You need to be talking to candidates, lead generating, doing your job every day. Uh, you need to be picking up jobs every day, right? And, and to pick up jobs every day, you need to be doing the prospecting part really well. And you just need to be over-delivering, right? And, and, and what I mean by that is if we look at today's world, everyone, you, you go to a cafe, you get the level of service you expect or less, Right. Very few places wow me in terms of customer service. Your job as a recruiter is to wow people right? and make that make those moments really, really clear. So if I'm interviewing someone, interviewing a candidate, I'm very clear on this is what working with me looks like. I'll always return your phone calls. You know, I'll always be transparent. This is what we're going to do every step of the process. And then I own that process right? because candidates become clients. But that simple act of over-delivery, year one, two, three, ten, gives you a name and reputation in the market that few can hold up to. Right. And once you've got that trust, once you've got those relationships, then price, you know, you're less sensitive to price, a lot more retained work, a lot more exclusive work. And people know what good looks like then because you're spelling it out to them. You're not just being good. You're highlighting how good you are in a you know, very humble, mm. you know, you know, quiet way. I do exactly the same with clients. You're going to work with me. This is how I work. This is the process, whether it's contract or perm. These are my expectations. 
right? I'm guaranteeing you an outcome here. This is how I'm guaranteeing that outcome. So I think that's the other thing people miss is, again, they, they, they get, get excited by a job. Oh, cool, I've got a job, off I go. Um, but they don't think about, well, how am I setting myself apart? Because if you can set yourself apart in every process for one, two, three, ten years, you know, that's how you build a brand, that's how you build a reputation. Of course, there's other ways you can do it on social and, and you know, all that proof and all of that stuff is also very valid. But at the end of the day, word of mouth trumps everything. Yeah. Okay, so prospecting, over-delivering. Yeah, um, candidate activity. Candidate activity. Yeah. Do you do anything like time blocking for BD or anything yeah. along those lines? Yeah, so you have to, right? So yeah. show me your schedule. That shows shows me your success. So if I meet a recruiter and they're like, I don't have a schedule, I just kind of wing it. It's like, great, you're probably a 400K biller. Right? And there's nothing wrong with that, but the the excellence or that scale from good to great is often found in your calendar. Right, so where is that time for prospecting? Where is that time for, for the candidate part that you need to know you need to do, that lead generation part that you know you need to do? And of course, have that, that room in the middle of the day for proactive, reactive, firefighting, who happens, deal with that. But you've got to have your day scheduled out like that. And you've got to be militant with it, right? Don't be like, oh, okay, the client said, you know, and this is one I get all the time. Oh, but the client said they could only meet at Friday at nine o'clock. Come on now, right? Like if the client really values what you do, you're telling me they're not going to book another time? You're telling me you can't push back on that? Um, but so many recruiters, that's what they do to, to get away from the discomfort, right? So they book a client meeting because I don't want to be here for the BD the BD hour of power. I don't want to be here for the BD day. So I go and book things. Or, oh, I've got interviews or I need to close this role. No, you just need to get your schedule right. Mm. Um, so setting up that schedule and, and, being, and, and tweaking that as you go and learning from others. Okay, what are other people doing schedule-wise that might work better? Um, you know, whether that's BD in the morning versus BD in the afternoon, right? Every every sector will, will, will have its own quirks, right? But you've got to, like that schedule is what drives success. And that's no different inside of work and outside of work. If I, if I see someone schedule outside of work, I can tell you how committed they are to what they do, right? If you're on Netflix every night or you're scrolling on TikTok or, you know, whatever, whatever people are doing these days, it's like, cool, I know you're not that hungry, mm. right? Um, you know, per, oh, so personal development, that would be the other one I'd, I'd put in your list of five must-haves. You have to have half an hour, hour a day without fail. And that's the one people don't do. But they'll watch four hours of Netflix a night. It's like, how bad do you want to grow, right? So you're a salesperson, you're a recruiter. Okay, what are the, what are the, what's core to your craft? You know, sales, relationships, marketing, social media, how to close a deal, um, psychology, you know, all of those things. But, but, but what investment are you putting into your craft, right? You know, it's funny that you say that. And it really resonated with me when you first brought it up uh, during one of the inductions. Mm. And you said something along the lines of, are you just expecting your work experience to get you better? Yeah. Or are you doing anything outside of actual your work experience? Because if you just think, I've been doing this for four years, so I'm just naturally getting better. Yeah, you might be a little bit, but you're, not, you're probably not actually being great. Yeah. Um, if you're not spending outside of work hours to hone your craft, whether it be sales, communication, yeah. all this kind of stuff. And um, that's definitely something that, I, I don't know any recruiters or very a uh, very minimal amount of recruiters that are proactively investing their own money into getting better at their craft, whether they work for an agency or, or you know, have their own agency. Yep. That's something that I think maybe a lot of people lack. So what are some of the things that someone could do right now outside of business hours in their own time and invest in themselves? Is there anything that you go, you need to, I don't know, pick up, this book or yeah. listen to this podcast or, or what kind of personal development stuff are we talking? Yeah. So I'm going to touch on, on a couple of points first and then I'll answer your question. So um, when I look at say the four year recruiter, it's like, are you a four year recruiter or have you had one year four times over? Right. And, and that happens along. It's actually, you're a one year recruiter. Like you've never actually got better. You've never actually grown. Right. And the secret sauce there is that is the personal development bit. It is that getting better. And yes, some of that you'll get by osmosis sitting in the right environment or going through that training course, but you need to control your destiny. It comes back to that life life by design, right? Like you're the author of the book, right? Write a freaking damn good book, right? Um, but where can you start? Simple, like you know, what are those core skill sets? Pick up a book, right? Who is the leader in that space? So if, if I'm looking at sales, there's some, you know, there's a bunch of great people you could you could read from. But you know, I've had the opportunity to have lunch with Jack Daly. He's written um, Hyper Sales Growth, awesome book. Anthony Inarino's written a bunch of books. Um, Jeb Blunt. Um, you can find them online. If you're not a reader, you can you can get into a podcast. Jeb Blunt's fanatical prospect. Yeah, yeah. sales gravy, yeah. isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, sales yeah. IQ, sales gravy, yeah, fanatical yeah. prospect. All good books, right? Right. Um, 
And you're going to have takeaways. if you, you, you can't read that content and not get better as a salesperson, mm. right? Um, you need to invest in courses. And then I'm going to go back to that sport parallel. I look at LeBron James, right? Everyone would say he's not the GOAT. Jordan's the GOAT, just FYI. <laughs> but he spends a million dollars a year on his body, right? Because his craft is basketball, right? Um, now he earns you know, 30, 40 plus endorsements, whatever. Um, so it's probably 1% of his income. Um, but... No rec- recruiters wouldn't be spending 1%, 10% of their income. You know? It's like go on the courses, get the learning. Why would you not meet someone who's more advanced than you and take those skills and take those learnings? Um, you know, if it's leadership, John Maxwell, you know, again, I've had lunch with John Maxwell, um, you know, did, did his course, paid extra to, to, to go to the lunch, and in that half an hour, like, that, that was worth the extra 500 bucks. Um, because you're sitting somewhere who's written you know, 90 books just on leadership, and he was like, open Q&A, awesome. Um, yeah, but you need to invest. If, if, if you're not a recruiter investing in yourself, you're kidding yourself. Just just spend the money, right? And and start out one, two, three K, whatever. It's tax deductible. Why would you not do it? Find a coach, right? Like, um, and it's interesting. The great people are willing to do that. If I look at the people I coach, they're all over a million bucks, mm. right? They're all running great businesses. Um, yeah, and they're the ones who are seeking me out. It's not the person who, who wants to go good to great. It's the person who's great, who's like, hey, how do I go from great to whatever the next level is, whether that's in work, whether that's outside of work, whether that's all of that together, they're the people who are seeking me out. Yeah, 100%. So what's the biggest difference between someone that wants to go from good to great and then great to pinnacle? Ooh, that's a deep question, man. <laughs> um, I think that, that, that good to great, it's like part of that will be you've got, you've got a talent, part of that will be you've honed that talent. Um, but you haven't really unlocked all the keys yet. So, I, I, what is good actually? Before we, before yeah. We so I'm going, I'm going to say good is four to five hundred k. Right. Okay. If you're at four to five hundred k, you're good. Like you've, you've shown that you've got a level of capability. Um, you've got a skill set. For me, you're not great unless you've, you've hit that that million dollar number. Right. Yep. And that journey from good to great. A lot of that is just things you don't know. So it is your schedule. It is being willing to say no to clients. It is taking better job briefs. There's so many things you can pick up where you can get these one, one percenters where you can find, find that uplift just by tweaking, right? So our, the 90 day induction we do, a big part of that is how do you think, how do you turn up, what is excellence in the recruitment process, how do we build that out, you know, how do you sharpen up everything that you're doing good to great? So that, I think that jump is, is, is actually one of the easier jumps because um, it's just about not, you know, what you don't know. I think that jump from great to, to pinnacle that's the harder jump, right? Okay, so so just to cap off on that, recap, sorry. So from good at 500K to great at a million bucks, yep. um, that's a pretty easy jump. I think, yeah. Okay, yeah. so so you're pretty confident. If someone was billing 500K, you'd be able to get them to billing a million bucks yep. should they have the, the ambition that they want to get there. Yeah, ambition and drive, right? So ambition is a, like, that's a lovely, it's kind of a bit like motivation, right? For me, it's more... Uh, uh, the drive and sacri- if you've got the drive and the sacrifice, that journey is simple. It really is simple because you can just deconstruct what someone does, challenge their mindset, challenge their identity, how they turn up to work, tie in their goals, and then just break it down. Right? And it's usually just steps. It, yeah, it's, um, it's very straightforward, I think, to go that, that good to great. That great to pinnacle, that's hard because pinnacle is undefined, mm. right? So if I look at the people who are, who are excellent, who are, who are great, you know, mil plus, and they're looking at kind of what is that journey, um, it's different for everyone. And, and of course, it's different for everyone in every space, but usually that good to great is just half a mil to a mil. That mil plus is more, how do I switch off when I get home? You know, how do I build a better relationship? How do I have it all when you can't have it all? So how do I, you know, build two million bucks, uh, you know, be in good shape, be a great dad, uh, or That's great, or great mom, um, you know, how to, you know, and, and do all the things. Like That's funny. It's like almost full circle. Yeah. So it's like, Start again. what are you going to sacrifice <laughs> to get from 500 K to a mill? Yeah. And then once you're at a mill, how are you going to get back to getting your, your work? I wouldn't say work life balance, but ha- getting your, your house in order, your personal life and how you can level up that. Cause I guess you've been sacrificing yeah. to get from 500k to a mil is that right yeah and it's kind of how do you get that integration right because your, your skill sets in, so if you look at time you know time talent intensity your talent has gone through the, so that journey 500 to a mil your talent has in, increased significantly you've won some of your time back because you've, you're working smarter you know as cliche as that is you're working smarter you you know where you can win that time back and and you know, hopefully your intensity is there either way but you know you might have got more intense you know on that journey as well 
Um, once you get to that level, it is kind of then, well, what does success look like now? Because you, you've, d- you've done the money part, right? And, and once you get to a level of performance, you won't clip back. I've, 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 I haven't met a million dollar biller who's like, oh, all of a sudden I'm back doing 500, right? It's like once you get to a standard and you set that standard in your mind and that becomes your identity or who you are, I'm a million dollar biller, you know, not that you'd sing that from the rooftops and I actually hate that title, but um, once you get to a level of performance, you won't go back. A, a, a great performer will make money in a, in a market that's good down, you know, up, down or, or sideways. But then it's about how do I then weave in these other things? You know, how do I win it all? Right? And that's a lot of the conversations I have with people who, who I coach is, you know, we, I openly say you can't have it all, but how do I win it all to a point where I'm happy? So we you know, do a circle of, you know, circle of life, you know, family, friends, uh, hobbies, holidays, you know, fitness, whatever. Um, you know, how do we get that to 10 out of 10? And what does that look like? And how do I have that conversation with, with my significant other? How do I have that conversation with my kids? And again, what am I willing to sacrifice is still that, that, that key question. What are you willing to sacrifice? Well, what is the sacrifice though? I mean, cause sometimes I, sp- I speak to recruiters and, and you, and you go, look, are you prepared for the next day? Yep. Is, is your day set up so you can walk into your day and absolutely nail it? And most of the time it was like, oh, no, I just turn up and go, all right, what am I doing today? Yep. And then my next question is, all right, well, what did you do last night when you went home? Like, oh, just sat on TikTok, yeah. watched the TV. <laughs> I was like, don't you have better things to do? Like, yeah. wouldn't you rather be performing better in your role and just sacrificing? I don't even think that's a sacrifice, but just substituting yeah. the brain dead stuff Yep. for progress yep. and half the time when they realize that and they go you know what i'm literally i've got literally nothing better to do mm-hmm. than to just perform better at my job like yep. if i just get out of my own way i'll be able to perform better life gets easier yep. i get to pay my debt down and yeah life just gets 10 times better when you're actually successful yeah yeah but people don't set goals right again they live life by accident so it's like, well, why would I do that? Or, or you can't see that direct correlation. It's like going to the gym, right? Go to the gym for a month. You're probably not going to see any change. Go to the gym for five years. Probably, I've, you, know, you would hope I've got a rig if I'm eating clean and doing the right things. Um, it's no different with personal development. You, the value isn't in book one, book 10. The, the value is in book 200, mm. right? Where you start seeing connections that you wouldn't really see, right? So if I read Fanatical Prospecting, it's like, that's a great book and you can learn from that. So, uh, And there's various books that I'd, I'd put in that category, but the value isn't in, in reading fanatical prospecting. The value is in, okay, I've now read 50 sales books and I can see the connections of each and I've now built out my own script or I objection handle you know, 100 times better because I've got 10 books. So I then read the leadership book and I realize how sales and you know, I get that correlation between sales and leadership um, or I get the language of leaders, you know, whatever that might be. But you only pick that up. You know, by by being you know, by by putting in the reps, mm. um, and so many people don't want to put in the reps. So, and 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 sacrifice is interesting. I don't believe it's a sacrifice either, but that comes down to how you define sacrifice. Because a lot of people would look at my life and be like, "You sacrifice so much time with your kids early days." I'm like, "Well, I don't feel that way, right?" Because we made the commitment. We knew what the sacrifice is. Um, there's no right or wrong. It doesn't mean I'm right because I've chased success in this domain, and, and someone else has chased success at home. And there's a individual who used to work with me and he was like matt you know i I, i'm all about family that's what i want to do he was he was doing six six fifty k earning good money um, so he's earning you know kind of low twos he's like matt i don't want to take that next step right i want to be i want to be there for for my daughter and my son and i want to pick them up drop them off you know etc etc i'm like cool but that's going to cap you right because from a time point of view you're, you're cutting back your time you know, your talent, you know, you're, you're very talented, but just not having the time isn't going to help and your intensity is already really high. So if you look at those three levers, you know, you've just got to understand that the sacrifice you're making to do those family things is, is, is a number and that's not right or wrong and you can change that at any, any stage, but you've just got to be aware. And most people aren't aware of, okay, this choice has this consequence because they don't think to that layer, layer of depth. Uh, and that's why you hire a coach or, or, you, or you work with a really great mentor because they can point out those things. Okay, that, that choice has this consequence. What are the biggest takeaways that you get from coaching people? Because I, I'm, I'm going to relate this almost back to ex recruiter and the gym. And yep. the analogy I like to, the analogy that I like to put out is, um, sometimes we speak to recruiters and they go, "Look, I want to start my own recruitment agency." Some people want to go do it by themselves. Some people want to do it with ex recruiter. And uh, the analogy I like to put out is, "Look, anyone can go to the gym mm-hmm. and, and say I go to the gym." Yep. But if you're a first-time business owner and you're going out on your own, um, like going to the gym for the first time, like you could walk through the door and 
you know, muck around with a few machines, mm. see what they do, mm. not do the right form, and, and eventually understand the mechanics of the gym layout, what machines you should be doing, all that kind of stuff. But if you go uh, turn up on, uh, to, the, to the gym on day one with a strength and conditioning coach mm. that tells you exactly what machines you should be on so you don't waste any of your time, you do the right forms from day one, mm. like the, the difference between someone with a coach – for example, like yourself, mm. if they were to join X Recruiter and having a crack by themselves. For me, I know it's like night and day difference because yeah. I value the mentorship, the coaching, the communication, the collaboration. Mm. That's obviously what we live and breathe at X Recruiter. But for someone that, you know, you've just joined X Recruiter, what do you see um, that people get out of having that coach, that accountability, that person that is like uh, on, the, on their shoulder talking to them about things that maybe they don't see? Yeah, so I think you've touched on a, on a, on a few parts there, but I think you don't know what you don't know, mm-hmm. right? So so as you join X and, and and you're starting out as a business owner, most people haven't been business owners; they've just been recruiters, right? And and they'll be recruiters somewhere in that good to great or or, or beyond. Um, but it's that person who can go, okay, you've now started your own business. This is what you know. This is what a sales strategy looks like. This is how you do a PL. and l This is you know, how you activate that muscle. So if I'm thinking at the gym, this is how you activate the muscle and get the most out of it. Here's how we accelerate your growth you know, or your gains. Um, they're the things you get by having a coach. Uh, or if I relate it to boxing, because I like boxing, right? You need that external person because when you're in the thick of it, and, and I think this is a better analogy than the gym, when you're in the thick of it and you're in the fight, and that's what starting a business is, right? You're in the fight. Like, it's like single swim, right? You know, you're now a business owner. You're not got a salary. It's, it's all on your back. When you're in a fight, you can't see those finer points. That's what a coach brings, right? So if I look at me sparring in boxing, it's like I might think I'm doing a good job and, you know, I'm weaving this way and I'm throwing a one-two or whatever it might be. But I'm coming out to the coach every, you know, every three minutes for that one-minute break and he's like, Matt, your opponent's doing A, B, C. You need to duck, weave and, and throw this shot and you're going to win the fight. That's what a coach brings. And I think that's, mm. that's the value of a coach, you know, whether it's in, in X recruiter or, or externally, is they see the things you don't see because you're in the fight. Right? So when you're in your fight, you're blinkered. You, know, you don't see the peripheral. They give you the peripheral. Um, they give you that vision you don't have and they show you the way to win. Um, All right, I'm going to use that, that show now you the on. way to win is really important. Yeah. Um, you know, because they've been there, they've done that, and they're objective. Right? So, so they're, they're looking at things from a different angle. Um, and, and I think that's where the value is. And, and I, yeah, I think fighting is a, is a perfect example of that. And, and you'd see that, you know, in any of the sports you watch, um, you know, those, a great coach is the difference maker. Yeah. Um, I don't think Jordan would have been who he was without Phil Jackson. Um, you know, that, that great coach makes all the difference. Many people. Yeah. They look like the star of the show, but yeah. there's a team of people around them. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and if I look at my career, you know, touching on those mentors, if I didn't have them, I would not be the person I am, right? And I, I'd like to think I've achieved a, a high level of success. But if you take out those people, you know, I, I think I'm 50% of where I am, right, at best. And, and, and that's with all the habits, all the routines, all the, you know, all the drive in the world. But you need those people who push and prod you the right way. You need those people in your inner circle that you trust, right? So, and, and one of them can be your partner. There's, there's a risk there, and we probably don't have time to talk about that today, about how people really, really close to you and your family can actually be bad because they, they usually say don't do that and they're risk adverse. But uh, I don't have that, which is good. But you want to have the, that circle of people who be like, Matt, you know, you're turning into this. Or, hey, be aware of this pitfall. Be aware of this challenge because um, you don't see it. Right? I don't see it in my life now. There'll be certain things where I, I just get so like I'm chasing that outcome whereas I need you know, every now and then that person to pull me out and be like, hey, have you thought about this? Um, you need those people in your life. Oh, mate, I think it's the most undervalued thing being able to pick up the phone and just get the answer yeah yeah or work through the answer right because i don't i I don't think a good coach gives you the answer i think they help you work through that answer Mm. so if i look at the people i coach it's not like hey matt i need abc unless it is you know a a, a more junior person who's just like yeah okay it's something pretty simple but it's more about how do you think about that and how do i give you the skills to to then think the right way in the future so that maybe you don't need to make that call Right, so so I think that's the difference between a good and a great coach. A good coach will be like, yeah, you need to, you know, when this happens, you need to do A, B, C. A great coach will be like, when that happens, this is how you should think, right? And here's a decision making framework, and here's how you should consider how you tackle that problem, um, to then be able to do that yourself and teach other people to do that yourself. Um, so you shouldn't really be ringing your coach for you know the same problem over and over again, because you should be learning and growing and changing your mindset and how you approach things. That's I think that's what a great coach gives. Yeah. 
I love that. I, I want to also um, put some light on your time at Oric, mm. and then also what your goals are with X Recruiter and, and the important piece of the puzzle that you play uh, yeah. here with us. So firstly, um, your probably your most notable experiences at Oric. That's yep. where you spent the longest amount of time. You had yep. the most amount of success. So, so walk us through Oric, how you started, how it ended and like what the learnings were there. Yeah, so so Oric was yeah, you know, and and I love the Oric guys, and, and shout out to all, all all the guys and girls there. Um, so I started in Oric in 2010, 2011. Um, met Saul, um, was their GM of Melbourne, so so big driver of me at the time, which is going to sound a bit ego, but I wanted to be a GM before I was 30. I was 28, and I had a goal to be a CEO before 35. I learned that that was more ego and a title than than, than probably mattered over the journey. But um, so I started there, you know, literally a team of three in Melbourne who had no idea what they were doing at the time. Um, none of them had done recruitment uh, and kind of went on the journey. I think the business and and someone can correct me on this if they if they like, but I had maybe 100, 150 contractors when I started. Melbourne, Sydney, Canberra, Singapore. Um, we exited out of Asia kind of during that journey because it was just too up and down and, and couldn't get that contractor base where it needed to be. When I exited, they were they were pushing towards 600. So it was a huge kind of growth journey over that 10 years um, across those those portfolios. So I was a billing leader in Melbourne, you know, then moved more into a, a traditional GM role as, as the team grew, but I've always billed. Like I like to bill, I like to be on the tools, you need to learn, set that example, set that tone. So I always did a mill. While I was while I was leading that team, um, and then you know, over time took over Melbourne and Sydney as we were looking to exit to to Randstad, and then as we exited to Randstad, I moved into the MD CEO position you know, for that two year earnout as, as Saul exited the business. And uh, what yeah. was that like going into the MD top dog role, going through a, like a, a buyout? Was that was that crazy? Was that easy? Was that a challenging moment in your career? Yeah, I'm going to say it was a natural progression. I think, you know, once I was doing Melbourne and Sydney and, and we, we ended up hiring a, a phenomenal um, MD for, for Sydney, but I think as we went through that transition, it was easy. I still had Saul as an advisor and, and, and he's been an amazing advisor and friend to me, you know, even post OREC uh, to, to this day. Um, but I think having him as an advisor behind the scenes was, was really, really helpful um, and having an amazing team. So, yeah, Ryan was, was the GM in Canberra, uh, phenomenal leader, phenomenal, uh, yeah, just phenomenal human being. Um, so having him, you know, kind of by my side and he'd been with that journey, you know, I was, I was 10 or 11 years when I exited. He was, you know, maybe two years behind. Um, we had, you know, such an amazing leadership group that it was actually easy um, yeah, and such a high-performing team that it's like you knew that you, – the levers we had six month off sites where we'd push the team the right way you know fix the mind you know fix the mindset or challenge mindsets drive them the right way and there were so many high performers there that it was actually easy yeah right interesting was it so that was there any like kind of political corporate you know things happening with a buyout and a t- like sometimes when i when i hear of like buyouts earnouts and acquisitions yeah. and all this kind of stuff it can get like messy yeah and nasty yeah that wasn't the case? No, nah, so if I look at, and, and and kudos to Randstad here, right, and they're probably not expecting me to say this, but I think they handled the, the transaction really well. Um, they, they retained the brand, so they retained the Orec brand and the Chelfont Consulting brand, which was a consulting arm that we built kind of, you know, among that journey. They retained that brand, and I think that's helped, that helped retain the people, and they, they weren't getting involved in the day-to-day. So we weren't co-located, separate offices, separate, separate leadership, very different mindsets, and then, you know, I was involved to, to a degree in the, in, in the tech strategy for Randstad. I was invited to, to, to be part of that kind of conversation and invited, you know, um, them into, into our tent as well. And it was very clear that we think differently and, and, and there was certainly a different level of performance. If you go GP per head, and I, I won't share numbers, but the Oric one was, was certainly higher. Um, and I think a lot of that was just down to thinking. Um, that doesn't mean the Randstad model is wrong. When you're a billion dollar business, you have to think a certain way and you have to, you know, there's certain things you do because you're that size, yep. but I think Oric kept that kind of entrepreneurial DNA, uh, and so that's what stood them on Where's Oric what? now? Oric, is it still going? Yeah, 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 nice. yeah. So they're still still ticking along. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Stephen Stephen runs Sydney. Ryan's still in in Canberra. So they're two key leaders. Melbourne's has had some challenges since I've since I've departed. Uh, not not because of me, but I just don't think they've found the the, the right leader to mm. to scale that business. They've still got some really good consultants, but. I, I'm a big believer. Everyone, everything rises and falls on leadership. So I, I think when there's that leadership vacuum in any business, there's a, there's a challenge um, because if your leaders are, you know, a six out of ten, your business is a five. If your leaders are nine out of ten, your business is that you're not going to outgrow your leader. Um, and I think if you don't have a leader, then you know, again, you're just throwing it up for chance. Yeah. Why? Why do they? 
why did they acquire Oric and not change the brand? Like, what's the what's the benefit to that? Yeah, so so I think the, the reason for the acquisition was performance, okay. uh, performance and very little overlay of clients. Um, so when we kind of looked nationally, I, I think for a lot of the geographies, there was less than ten percent kind of shared client base. So it was really opened up a new portfolio for them as a group. Um, but it simply came down to performance, and I think the brand was so strong that they didn't want to they didn't want to lose that brand recognition in the geographies that they played in. Hmm. Okay, awesome. And so, so that was a, a su- super successful. You, yeah. you, you exited Orec. Uh, you went to TP. Yep. Had a good stint at TP. Yeah. Um, and now you're a part of the ex recruiter. So excited to be here. The rocket ship. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. And yep. so, so what is? And I know this is only early days, so yep. you know we're, we're talking off the cuff here. But yep. you know, w- what are the main goals or the the, the exciting journey that you're about to embark on? Like, what yep. what are you focused on at ex recruiter? Yeah, so I, I think the thing that drew me to, to execute outside of you, you boys, of course, which is a big part of that, is it's just the growth journey, right? So obviously my role is, a, is, is around growth. So growth of our number of partners that, that, that make that leap from great recruiter to, to business owner to phenomenal business owner, um, growth of their businesses and growth of them holistically. Um, and I look and go, that's what's made me a great leader. So if I look at what I think is, is, is my secret source between my leadership and my coaching is taking people on that journey um, but now we're taking them on a journey where the benefit for them is, is, is 10x, mm-hmm. right? So you take a recruiter in agency land from, from say, 500 to, to 700, right? 200 grand upswing. They're probably taking maybe 50 grand of that, right? 20, 20%, 30%. Um, you know, maybe a little bit more if they, if, if they go north of a mill. But if you take someone as a business owner from 500 to 700, well, they're taking, they're taking 90, right? 85, 90%. Um, so that's life-changing. Right, and and I've said this to people in recruitment for a long time. Recruitment at a hundred grand sucks. Yeah. It's it's a tough, <laughs> tough freaking slog, right? Uh, recruitment at two hundred, like okay, cool. Like I've, I've I've got a nice lifestyle, nice house. I'm, I'm probably starting to get some freedom. Recruitment at three hundred plus, four hundred plus is amazing. But to get that in agency land, like you've got to be doing one three, one four, one five. But if you're doing it as a business owner and you only have to do 500, like that's good, right? Yeah. That's not even great. So if I can take you from good to great, 500 to a mil, and you're a business owner, like that's a game changer, right? And for yeah. me, like I, you know, I've, I've, I've spoken a little bit about legacy and wanting to see people be the best version of themselves. Well, what an amazing way to unlock them, right? And, and unlock that potential. And then if you're looking at all well, training, development, coaching, it's like, well, yeah, as a recruiter, maybe earning 150 grand, you're like, oh, I'm a little bit uncomfortable to spend 10 grand. If I'm a business owner doing half a mil, what's 10 grand if it's going to get me half a mil? Like another half a mil, right? Yeah. Um, so I think what excites me about X recruiter is, is I get to use my skill set, but 10x the outcome, right? Yeah. And 10x the outcome for people. Because right? I'm a huge believer if you improve a person holistically, you improve them as a recruiter, you improve the result. Um, and that's what drives me. So it's here, like we've got this beautiful ecosystem of other, you know, other leaders, other owners that all want to help each other to be just freaking amazing you know, at what they do. And it's like, I just get to sit in the middle of that and, and just play growth mode, play coach, play mentor, um, but see the outcome 10 X. And that's what fires me up, right? Oh, it's, mate, it's just seeing people kill best, it, and, you know, buy, the, buy the new house, buy, you know, whatever success is for you. Cause it's not just financial, but or it might be giving them their freedom because I can now earn you know, twice what I've ever earned, but I've got that time with the kids. So if you look at that kind of trade-off and what does success look like, we've got more levers. You know, if people join X Recruiter, they've got so much more levers because they're in control of their freedom. Whereas you know, when you work for someone else, and I've done it, and I've done it really successfully, and I, I you know, would not change any of my time um, over that journey, but you don't have that freedom. You are locked into, you know, these are your hours. This is how many holidays you're going to take a year. You know, this is what we expect. This is when you're on. This is when you're off. Whereas as a business owner, you're in control of that. Man, I get jealous hearing that. And I get jealous because <laughs> if I started Vendito, you know, seven years ago or six years ago, whatever it yeah. was, and I got to be thrown into this community of other recruitment agency owners supporting me. Then I had Maddie like real juicing me up, getting oh, me from five hundred k to a million bucks. Office. Could you imagine? Hey, yeah. do you know how much like more fun and exciting the journey would have been if I yeah. had the support around me? And so, like the reason why we do this obviously is because Declan and I were once those recruiters with no support, no, having no yeah. idea what we're doing, just trying to figuring figuring it all out as we go. Um, but now you don't really have to, and to, mm-hmm. to get the the support, the coaching, the mentoring, the resources, mm-hmm. it's almost like it's the biggest no brainer. Yeah. Um, I, I say that because I've walked the shoes of what yeah. 
the other alternative is. But maybe for someone who hasn't taken the leap and started their own agency, they still might be sitting there thinking, oh, okay, do I do it by myself? Do I do it with an ex-recruiter? And mm-hmm. there's considerations there. But for someone that's walked both paths and seen people go with ex-recruiter and make a million bucks in their first year and then not go with ex-recruiter and then really feel like they're struggling and with no support and no yeah. no clarity on what decision to make next. I just get so excited about such a high level impact, as you say, you know, 10Xing yeah. people's outcomes is yeah. really fun and exciting and seeing the light bulb go off yeah. and them getting really excited about, holy shit, I can do this. It's just a super rewarding feeling. Yeah, and that support and tools are super important because a lot of people say to me, hey, Matt, you've done a you know, million dollars a year for your entire career. Why, why not go out on your own? Right Now, the, the Auric journey was very clear, right, because we were chasing, chasing an exit. I had equity in that business and, 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 and it made sense. But even then, you know, Saul kind of post, post Auric was like, Matt, you just go out on your own. Like, why, why, why join this business when you can just do it on your own? You're a performer. Or, or. But I think even when you're great, you still have those voices in your head. Well, how am I going to do ABC? Who is going to support me? You know, what is that? What is that network of people? Because you don't have that, right? Whereas if, if X Recruiter was around 10 years ago, you know, may, maybe I'm doing something different. But, um, but for me, you know, it hasn't just been about starting my own business. It's about coaching other people to be successful. That's what actually you know, excites me and makes me happy. But it's just a vehicle that you know, hasn't been available. So kind of kudos to you boys to, for, for doing that. And I think you know, for people like me or, or you know, somewhere in, in, in my 15-year journey, it's like, it's an absolute, I agree with you. It's an absolute no brainer. Yep. Maybe I'm a little biased. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> I think it, is it the people that don't do it, they're yep. scared of the accountability of having yeah. to make shit happen. Yep. Um, but the ones that do it to have multiple seven figure business owners in yeah. X recruiter in their first year of business and X recruiter is only 18 months old. Yeah. Like we're fucking working it out too. So yeah. And that's already what's happening. That is yeah. exponential. Like, you know, I was chatting to Jory the other day. He's like, yeah, mate, I spoke to my mate. He's a mechanic. And I told him what we're doing. And he's like, what the yeah, actual damn. fuck <laughs> is going on there? Yeah. Like, this is not real life. Like, yeah. and yeah. multiple partners are in that situation. Like yeah. 150K months, 70K months, PBs, yeah. Yeah. growing 35% a month. Like, this is extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. We're finding, uh, I, I did some stats just the other day and most of the partners that join ExRecruiter end up billing more out on their own yep. by themselves in their first couple of months mm-hmm. than they do at their previous agency with all the support and training and database and all that yep. kind of stuff that they get. And I did I did put a post about it like we've kind of got an unfair advantage at ExRecruiter because the people that join are ambitious recruiters, yep. they're experienced recruiters, they're um, – The top one or two. Yeah, the, yeah the, they're the always top. in that great or yeah. you know, pushing Good. towards that great. Yeah. 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 yeah, and yeah. and most people think of starting your own business, hopefully I'll break even my first year or mm-hmm. I'll be on baked beans and, and yep. spaghetti for the first 12 months. And then as soon as they get like pushed into this, like, this network mm-hmm. of other high-performing agency owners, all of a sudden they go, oh, shit. You know, I went three weeks without a salary and now I'm making 50 grand a month. Yeah. This is yeah. like completely life changing. And so a lot of people don't uh, probably uh, realize that, you know, success is one decision away mm-hmm. in, in a couple of weeks. And it's it's not this super long grind to try and get back to where you were in, in agency land, yeah. Yeah. which... You know, we speak to a lot of million dollar billers and they go, oh shit, I don't know if I could They're the most scared. They're the most scared. A lot of them are the most scared. Most highly leveraged. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Or they're comfortable, right? Again, you've you've got to that big fish, and you might be a big fish in a big pond at at, at that level, but, you know, there's still that like, I'm comfortable here, right? Do I want to jump into a new pond? And, you know, is there food in the new pond? And I'm not quite sure. Um, you know, so I think there is a mindset thing there. I've been there, right? So I, I, I get that mindset, mm. but it's like, you've now got the tools, the ecosystem, the people, the coaching, you know, everything you need to, to, to kind of make that work. So the risk, you know, the level of risk is, is substantially lower. Um, so it's like, why not? And um, what you teach, Matt, I haven't heard anyone speak the way you do. Yeah, like on, on what you talk about, honestly, yeah. like I haven't found it in another book. Yeah. I haven't found it, it like on any academy. I haven't found it you know, chatting to, to any other recruitment leaders or business owners. Cause if, if they knew about it, they'd be fucking doing and teaching all their staff it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So like I'm sitting there in a recruitment excellence um, class mm-hmm. and I'm like, holy shit, I couldn't even write that out on a board. Yeah. 
And yeah, I, f- I feel like we're learning to be better recruiters and we're not actually recruiting anymore. And I feel like <laughs> I've got the itch to be a recruiter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, fuck, I'd love to be a recruiter again with the amount of shit that I know. I'm from a million listening. bucks. <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah, totally. I think it's going to be, the next 12 months are going to be absolutely insane. If we're like yeah. talking about multiple seven-figure business owners, records yeah. being broken month on month, yeah. like the next 12 months are going to be extraordinary and you're going to play a huge part in that. Yeah, so I'm stoked. I can't when, wait. when do we start chatting about like what, what little other things you're going to be doing in extra recruiter like maybe we can slowly roll slowly it out roll over it the out. next three months we don't want to we don't want <laughs> to give all, it all the way now yeah, yeah you have to get a certain <laughs> limit of Im- imagination <laughs> yeah, yeah no we're, we're, we're super excited about yeah, this same. journey we think um you joining X recruiter is we're super grateful um and we think it's going to definitely take us to the next level that we're excited about so yeah. uh we're really pumped to be able to share the journey with all these other recruiters that are probably sitting there thinking fuck should i do it now should i do it and then maybe seeing maddie come on board and going hey now you're also going to get a high performance recruitment coach to yeah. level up your your agency then maybe that might just be the push that everyone the needs ice bath sessions yeah all the other barley stuff time all the yeah. holistic yeah. stuff we do all yeah. the holistic yeah. stuff yeah. We do. recruitment's just a small part i, yeah. I imagine but yeah. the thing I'd say is that like people want to see you win, right? And I think I think this is the thing I've noticed, you know, the more I've hung around our partners is when you take that leap out of agency land, your cl- your clients, your customers, if you are in that good to great, they want to see you win, right? They want to help you win. So it's actually not as hard as you think because it's not like, oh, do I need, need to go and get another piece of paper? It's like they want they want to work with you. They work with you, you not with whatever the business card is, not that we do business cards anymore, but, you know, they work with you as a person and they want you to win. And once it's yours, it's like, that's that's pretty cool feeling. Well, look at the office down the road, mate. There's 12 recruiters. They don't give a shit about any other... They're all in their own agencies. Yeah. It has no reflection on whether the bloke next to them does well. Yeah. yeah. But they all want them to do well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so love it. love it. it's um it's awesome. And then once this goes live, the Melbourne office, ex-recruiter Melbourne office will be open as well. Yeah. Really? Exciting times. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. Uh-huh. Let's do it. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks Sweet. for joining us, Matty. Really boys, appreciate thanks it. Thanks for having me. Pumped on the next 12 months. Let's go. Thanks for tuning in to another Confessions of a Recruiter podcast with Blake and Declan. We hope you enjoyed and got a lot of value and insights out of this episode. If you do have any questions or you would like to recommend someone to come on the Confessions podcast, we would love any introductions. And remember the rule of the podcast, like, share, and recommend it to a friend. Until next time.